Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by myself, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, C. Shang from the, the, from the Ohio State University, and Catherine McLean from Temple University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang from Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Leontine Gozel, uh, entitled Financial Incentives for Smoking Cessation in Pregnancy, a Multi-Center RCT. Leontine is an Associate Professor of Economics at EDHEC Business School, having gained her PhD from Paris School of Economics in 2015. Her area of research is applied microeconomics with special interests in health economics and behavioral economics. The study of the economic, de uh, of the economic determinants of preventive health behaviors and evaluating the behavioral response to health policies are the unifying theme of her research. Our discussion today is Dr. Justin White. Dr. Gosel, uh, thank you for presenting for us today. Please. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present this work. Let me share my screen. So thank you very much for inviting me to present this work uh, today. This is a joint work with a multidisciplinary team composed of medical doctors, midwives, as well as economists. We are all uh, French and we conducted this uh, randomized trial in France. This uh, is about financial incentives to help pregnant smokers uh, to quit smoking. We were funded by the National Institute Against Cancer and the only uh, funding that we obtained to conduct this randomized control trial. So the, the main motivation here is really related to um, trying to help pregnant smokers to quit smoking because there are large or adverse health consequences for the newborn. Among them, uh, there is increased likelihood of premature uh, birth, but also low birth weight, which is uh, babies that are less than 2.5 kilos. But consequences are not only at birth, but they also have uh, long lasting effects. And among them, there is very well known respiratory diseases such as asthma, but also increased likelihood of uh, chronic diseases such as obesity. From the economic literature, we also have uh, Interesting papers showing that low birth weight is a strong predictor of worse uh, economic outcomes, such as um, lower level of uh, schooling and test scores as well as wages. And this is especially an important problem in France because marginal smoking during pregnancy is quite common. So we have um, data from different surveys, but, but I think this one, is, is really showing that almost a quarter of pregnant women are actually smoking every day. So to give you a little bit of context for, for interpreting this figure, a bit more than a third of women are of childbearing age are smokers uh, in France. So although a lot of them actually reduce smoking, they maintain some uh, smoking and they smoke daily. And we all have some other figure showing that they are uh, only, I mean, a little bit less than 22%. It reached 17% in the third trimester to be daily smokers. 
So a large population of women is still smoking during pregnancy. And in addition, there is large socioeconomic inequalities where more low-income women are more likely to be uh, smokers. And this is important because there are large neg negative externalities, as I said, on, on, the, on, on the newborn and on the child. And the specific problem that we have with pregnant smokers is that some studies have shown that the usual pharmaceutical treatments, such as the gums, the patches, uh, they have either low or no efficacy to help pregnant smokers uh, to quit smoking. So there is a need for new solutions uh, in order to help those pregnant smokers to quit smoking. So if we think about the trade-off um, that people make when they try to stop smoking, it's really a trade-off between the future benefits that they could gain from uh, smoking cessation versus the present loss of satisfaction uh, and the effort they have to exert in order to uh, stop smoking. The, the usual instruments uh, that policymakers have to try to impact this trade-off and make sure that people stop smoking is the tax on tobacco product, where here the idea is to increase the present cost of smoking. This has been shown to be uh, efficient in the general population, but there is some concern of equity because of the social gradient in smoking, then increasing the tax on tobacco product uh, may have uh, may impose a larger financial burden on low-income groups because those low-income groups are the ones who are more likely to stop, to quit. No, sorry, they're more likely to be smokers and they are less likely to be able to quit. And if we compare the tax on tobacco to financial incentives, the mechanism behind it is a little bit different. So here we are talking about financial incentives that are conditional on abstinence. And here the idea is really to compensate the person for the loss of satisfaction and for the effort it has to exert to quit smoking. And another way to compare those two instruments that are tax and financial incentives conditional on abstinence is to think about what is the marginal cost of smoking. So the marginal cost of smoking is this one cigarette uh, that you will smoke that is taxed, but the marginal cost of smoking for when you're part of a financial incentive program is all the money that you will not earn, that you will not be rewarded with because you smoke that one cigarette. So the marginal cost of smoking may be higher in the case of financial incentives than in the case of taxes. And if we look at some uh, equity aspects in the case of financial incentives, because it's a reward, we're providing extra budget here. Another important feature is that it's not possible to increase taxes for a targeted subpopulation. While we can start programs providing financial incentives for specifically uh, targeted groups. My goal here is not to say that we should replace financial incentives, uh, we should replace the uh, tax on tobacco by financial incentives, but rather than those two instruments may be complementary. So the question that we have in this paper is whether financial incentives are efficient tools that could help pregnant women stop smoking and improve newborns' health. So when we think about financial incentives, there is a wide uh, number of different type of designs for those incentives. So initially we had uh, two different type of incentives. One that is quite well known that is the deposit, where people will make a deposit and they will only regain the deposit if they stop smoking. There could be a reward added to this deposit. But at the other side of the spectrum, there is only providing a reward. So here, in this case, you will provide a reward. So this is here. And people will gain a reward for stopping smoking. You may have a constant reward or increasing reward. What I mean by constant reward is that every time the person is shown to be a non-smoker, he will get an amount of money, such as, like, let's say, $30. And every time she's a non-smoker, she comes back a month later, she's 
still non-smoking, she gets another $30. A different scheme will be increasing rewards where here she comes, the first time she gets $30, the next time she gets $60, then the next time $90. So you see the, the reward is increasing with the number of times the person in abstinence. Then you can add in addition something that is called a sanction of to relapse. So here the person will lose money if she relapses and smokes again. So typically those two features uh, of a design are here to try to uh, make people being continuously abstinent. And in the case of pregnancy to be continuously abstinent during the pregnancy, because here it takes into account that there is a continuous effort to be made for being continuously abstinent during the pregnancy. So all of those type of uh, incentive design exist in the literature of financial incentives for smoking cessation. And there's also a variety of amounts, a very different number of uh, type of participants, uh, a different type of settings, whether it's hospital or immunity wards or other type of uh, primary uh, care setting. And there's also different measures of abstinence, but overall there's this Cochrane review saying that overall financial incentives for smoking cessation among pregnant women is effective, but there is extremely large uh, magnitude of effects. So what we do to add to this literature is the following thing. We conducted a field experiment where we test the efficacy of financial incentives on maternal smoking during pregnancy. We have 18 maternity wards throughout the country that participated in this uh, trial here. And we provide vouchers to women who stop smoking and they were uh, seen as in the constipation every month. We have two groups, a control and a treatment group. Control group is really the usual care. So they will get what women will get when they are uh, pregnant and as well smokers. And the treatment group, we have uh, a reward system that has a dynamic structure, but I'll come back to this. We collect the data on uh, the mother's abstinence, as well as the, some outcomes of the newborn. Our main findings are that financial incentives are effective. They're able to improve uh, abstinence, and uh, they were also able to improve newborns uh, health outcomes. And I will also say a little bit more about financial incentive and inequalities. I just wanted to let you know that the main result of the paper are already published in the British Medical Journal, but that the, the last section of the results are, um, are new. So let me tell you a little bit more uh, about the design of this uh, field experiment that we uh, conducted. So as I said, it's, uh, it was conducted in 18 uh, maternity wards in the country, and we recruited participants that fulfilled those criteria. So they, they had to be smokers, of course, but they had to be daily smokers and to smoke at least five cigarettes per day. They also had to be at the, uh, in the first trimester of their pregnancy and motivated to quit. So they were asked on a scale to say whether they were motivated to quit and they had to be at least five out of 10 to uh, be included in the, in the study. Um, what is important is that if they were uh, smoking, uh, if they were vaping, they, wouldn't, they would be excluded from the, from the study because we have uh, no information on the impact of e-cigarettes uh, on, on the health of the, the mother and, and the child. So we decided that this will be exclusion criteria. So this is the timeline of the intervention. So they were first seen at this visit with a that has a specialty in tobaccology and who knows how to help uh, pregnant women who are smoker and know how to provide motivational counseling relapse and relapse prevention. They were also able to, um, to, to provide them with uh, patches and gums. So visit one, they are included in the study and randomized either to a control group here or a treatment group here. 
they were provided 20 euros for coming to the visit. Then they are randomized. So what happens to the control group is the following. They will be given the usual care for pregnant smokers and a participation, their participation is rewarded with 20 euros in vouchers. So those vouchers, um, they could be redeemed in a large number of shops from uh, supermarkets to uh, shops where they could buy clothes for the babies. There's a, a very large variety of, uh, of different shops. So after they've been randomized, they have five visits that they have to attend. So every one every month. So women in the control group, they could get they could earn a maximum of 120 euros. Well, the women who were randomized in the treatment group here, they obtain exactly the same thing that in the control group, but in addition, they have an incentive depending on their um, smoking status. And so they will get the 20 euros for coming to the visit, then an additional 40 euros if they are found to be abstinent at that time, then another visit if there is an increment of 20 euros and they will earn 60 euros if they are abstinent, then 80, 100, and 120. So you see there is increasing reward for continuous abstinence. And I want to also show you why we have a system that sanctions relapses or not coming to the visit. So here's how it works. So you have this participant, one here, and the six different visits. Remember, first visit is randomization. Then she comes to the second visit, she gets 40 euros because she is abstinent. Second visit, the amount that she gets increases, she gets 60 euros. Then on the fourth visit, she's been smoking, so she's not abstinent. So she doesn't get any money rewarding her abstinence. And the next time she comes, it's the fifth visit, she is again abstinent, but there is no increment here. The amount that she gets goes back to the last time that she was abstinent. So this is the mechanism sanctioning financially relaxing. In the sixth visit, she gets another uh, uh, amount of money where there is a, uh, an increment of 20 euros. So it's the same system for uh, women who didn't show up to the visit. So just before I show you how it works, total payoff here will be 360 euros. So this is the show up fee and this is what she will get for smoking cessation. So it's exactly the same thing for this other participant. You see at the fourth visit here, she doesn't show up and we make the hypothesis here. We assume that they were smoking so next time she comes and she is abstinent, the amount that she gets goes back to the last time that she was abstinent. And this person will get a total payoff of 240 euros. So the different outcomes uh, that we measured in the study, they both relate to the mother, but also to the child. But the main outcome here is continuous abstinence. So it's being abstinent from the second visit to the sixth visit. And it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of self-reporting abstinence and the uh, carbon monoxide exalt at uh, each visit. And those two things had to be uh, consistent to be uh, uh, for, for the reward to be uh, provided. So secondary outcomes were uh, a number of measures, including craving symptoms and withdrawal symptoms. And we had for the newborns, the most important outcome for us, which was the burst weight that we take first as a continuous viable, but also as a, a dermy viable, as well as poor neonatal outcomes, which is a composite indicator that basically counts the number of times that a baby was transferred to uh, intensive care, whether there is congenital malformation, convulsion, or death. So I think I'm 
already uh, ready to uh, start the results, but maybe there are some questions that I can answer before I, I present the results. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, let's turn to Justin White, our discussion first to see whether he has any questions. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, a few background uh, questions that I have is, what would be the usual care in this French context? And in particular, uh, you know, is, is it the counseling that, that's part of your control group or like how, how would NRT, nicotine replacement therapy or pharmaceuticals or e-cigarettes e be treated? Like are those also offered and are they available for free or low cost if, if a patient wants those? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so what they will get in the control and treatment group is what you will get in usual care. So they will have motivational counseling, uh, relapse prevention, as well as a prescription of nicotine replacement therapies that they will get for free. And this is true in the usual care as well as in the study. Okay, great. Um, I, I really like the use of your escalating rewards and the way that you handle the, um, you know, the reset of the incentives for a lapse or a relapse. But um, and especially the, the reset because it sort of, you know, sanctions the participants without sort of bringing them back to square one, you know, they, they um, can catch up very easily, which is nice. Um, I think we'd love to sort of know what's the effect of this escalating rewards schedule in particular, which is hard to sort of, te you know, pull apart uh, in a two-arm trial. And I'm curious about why you end up going with a two-arm design versus, you know, a, a three-arm design that say had a fixed reward schedule versus the escalating one uh, in, in sort of what, what the constraints were for you. Yes, of course. I mean, you're right. We're not able to, to tease out the effect of the, the effect of resetting uh, and the, re the increasing rewards. Uh, we came up with this one because it was the one that was uh, pushing more in the direction of continuous abstinence. So this is really what the goal of the study was, and this is why we decided to use this one. As uh, for the constraint of going for three-arm study, it was budget constraints. And also okay. recruitment, because uh, all the women were quite in favor of the study and, and, and willing to participate, there were more difficulties in convincing maternity wards to participate. So I guess if we were to have, I mean, if we had like three arms, they will also, you know, that like either the, the study will have like lasted maybe three or four years more. Yeah. Also this. Okay, great. And uh, you mentioned continuous abstinence, your, your primary outcome. I did have a question about how it was defined. Um, so going back to the paper, it looks like it was defined based on a self-report of not having smoked in the last seven days, plus the CO test, plus sort of prior visits. To me, like that's more of a almost seven day point prevalence uh, definition than continuous abstinence. Like if somebody smoked say eight days before the visit or uh, you know, it seems like they would still pass your continuous abstinence test. And I'm, I'm curious if you sort of like looked more carefully whether there were or would have captured whether that's the case at all. Yes, you're right. I mean, uh, the usual question asked in those studies only relate to the past seven days, which is a limit because we don't know what happened before. Um, and also the CO test is not perfect. If they were smoking three days before, we might not capture it as well. So, I mean, I have two types of answers. I mean, I have anecdotal answers from the investigators of the study that had like a very a strong relationship with the patients and felt that they were not lying, lying to. Uh, and the other thing is that, so we tried to uh, assess whether they were liars. Uh, so we, we conducted urine tests at inclusion and also one of the visits was uh, uh, randomly selected. So they would, uh, be uh, um, uh, another urine test. The idea here was to assess ex post, whether some people were not smokers when they get in the study or they were actually lying at the, at the, at the visit that they were measured at since. And the problem here is that the biological analysis of those samples massively failed. So we couldn't do anything with the... So bottom line is I can't tell you whether they lied. But if they had light, we would not see any effect on the babies. 
So my take is that there may have been some liars in the in the sample. Uh, it's very, we really tried our best to try to assess whether this is the case, and we couldn't find evidence. I mean, we we couldn't find good evidence that there are or there are not. What I can tell you is that if they were lying, they were more liars in the financial incentive group, right? I mean, they have more incentives to lie. And if they were more incentives to lie, there will be more discrepancies between declared abstinence and CO tested abstinence mm -hmm. than in the control group. And this is not what we observe. So this gives us a little bit more confident that what we capture is actually what happened in terms of uh, abstinence. Yeah, it's, it's too bad that the urine test failed, but I mean, I, it, kudos to you for sort of trying because, you know, especially CO testing has very short half-life and so it's easy to sort of evade, I think, but, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm glad you, you thought about that. Maybe if I could ask just uh, one more question before we uh, turn to the, the Q&A. Um, so you follow a pretty fairly, uh, pretty, I, I guess the, probably what I would say, the, the standard approach of assuming missing equals smoking. Um, which, you know, I, I've often done the same in my studies, but there, are, there also has been research that shows that that can bias estimates in favor of the arm that has the lowest proportion of missingness. And in this case, you know, that there would be, that, that would occur and I think did occur in the uh, incentive arm. And so I'm curious whether you also looked at alternative ways of dealing with missingness or how you sort of think about this missing equals smoking assumption. Yes, of course. So we, we run a number of sensitivity analysis where we impute smoking status from uh, the, the rest of the data that we have. We also uh, have a less restricted uh, definition of continuous abstinence and uh, all the results that we have are consistent with our main results. Okay. And um, as for like imbalance attrition between the group, like, you know, like they don't show up. Um, we have the same attrition in both groups. So we're not that concerned that there would be more attrition in the control group than in the treatment group. And so we would bias the, the results uh, towards uh, less abstinence in the, in the control group. Okay. See, do I have time for one more question or should we turn to q &A? Uh, I think let's, um, there are four questions in the Q&A. So let's get the Q&A, the questions there, answer first. Um, so I think you have already talked about um, urine sampling, but there is a question asking about uh, whether the level of CO will be influenced or impacted by living, working, or transporting in high traffic areas. And also ask about your sampling um, consider being considered instead of CO? I know you talked about this, but do you have any additional answers to that question? Uh, yes, thank you for, for this question. I think, so yes, CO can be influenced. I, I remember there's one case where um, I know there were some influence from the living area where there were CO in the air because of the cooking material that was used. And uh, this was taken into account, but this is the only case I've heard of. Um, otherwise, we were not able to take this into account. My understanding will be that because the randomization worked, the probability that the CO is impacted by those environmental factors will be equivalent in those two groups. So this should not be uh, uh, a problem in our study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there is a question from Lisa Kran asking, could you share the research that patches are not effective in cessation efforts during pregnancy? So, what, sorry, I, I missed some. Uh, so there, is... there was a research, um, did you mention research that patches, so nicotine patches, mm -hmm. are not effective in cessation during pregnancy? So, sure. Well, yeah. It's actually a study conducted by one of the co-author of uh, the study by Yvon uh, Berlin. I can, I, can, uh, I can share the reference later. And uh, there are two questions regarding alternative designs of considering substituting smoking with vaping uh, or consider adding a reward or, or vouchers for switching. So uh, I guess this question again about vaping and do you have any thoughts about whether such a Alternative design could be carried out um, in French setting, maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah, so in, in so let's say that, I mean, for us vaping, we had no information on whether vaping is toxic for the mother or the child. So the, the safe uh, decision that we uh, made was to um, exclude any women who would be uh, vaping from the study. Uh, before there is any uh, results uh, on this particular population, we uh, we decided that this was uh, what we would do. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Um, so please continue with the presentation. Thanks. Thank you for all your questions. So, I mean, the, 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 before getting to the results, I want to tell you a little bit more about who are uh, the participants of uh, this study. So we randomized 460 uh, pregnant women that were equally randomized into the control and the treatment group. All baseline characteristics were similar between the two groups, except for uh, two characteristics that are actually important um, for the analysis of the results. So the first imbalance between the two groups relates to the number of twins. So there were nine pairs of twins in the treatment group versus three in the control group. And uh, the other uh, issue here is the sex ratio. So this, is, this was rather unexpected because we had more girls in the treatment than in the control group. And those two imbalances actually um, affected the way we analyze the data because both twins and girls are more likely to have lower birth weights than uh, singleton and uh, boys. So what we decided to do is for uh, newborn's outcome, we excluded the twins from the analysis and for birth weight, we included, we controlled for, uh, we adjusted the regression for the sex of the newborn. I will now describe a little bit more precisely who were the participants uh, of the study. I think what is important to remember here is that uh, it's a particular type of uh, they are different from the general population, mainly because it's women who are low social status, where you have 70% of them who are below the median income in France, and only 60% are employed. They smoke every day, heavy smokers, because on average at inclusion, they report smoking almost three packs uh, a week. And 72% of them had uh, a smoking partner. As for uh, medical and obstetrical characteristics, most of them had no other child, and 10% uh, of them had um, maternal health disorder uh, since the, the beginning of the, of the pregnancy. So this is the, the main result. So what you see on this graph is here the share of women who are abstinent at a given visit. So at the first visit, they are randomized, and then you have what's happening until the last visit. In blue, you have the control group, and in red, the financial incentive group. And you see that directly from the start, you see a significant uh, difference between the abstinence rate and versus uh, uh, at, the, at the second visit uh, in the financial incentive group versus the control group. And if we look at our primary outcome, which is continuous abstinence, we find that in the financial incentive group, 16% of women were continuously abstinent, which means being abstinent from visit two up to visit six. Well, it's it's... 7% in the control group. So we were more than, we were able to more than double uh, the share of continuous abstinence uh, in the sample. There are, uh, but I, I mean, I discussed some of them already, but there were potential threats to the internal validity uh, of those results. One was whether there will be an balance between um, the two groups, according to whether uh, women will use decoding replacement therapies, and this is something that we measure. 
And what we find is that they were no different between the control and the financial incentive group. So here you have whether they have used nicotine replacement therapy in the last month. And you see there is no difference between the control and financial incentive group. Another threat was non-random attrition between the groups. So although there were quite a, a large uh, share of uh, dropout of the study, we couldn't see any difference between the control and the financial incentive groups in terms of the dropout rates at each uh, visit. So we are uh, pretty confident that what we observe in those results is actually due to the difference between the financial incentives and the control group. So the second set of results are about the newborn's outcome. So here you have what happened in the financial incentive group and here in the control group. So it's only when we take the burst weight as a dummy viable for whether the burst weight was below 2.5 kilos that we see something happening of uh, something happening. So what we observe here is that the probability of having a baby that is low birth weight decreases by almost six percentage points. This is only statistically significant at 51%, but as I told you, there are unbalancing, unbalances in terms of sex ratio between the two groups. So we adjusted for sex in a regression and what we found is that it slightly increased the size of the difference, and this is now statistically significant below uh, the 5% uh, threshold. What we also observe is that our composite indicator here that is composed of, uh, that is actually mainly composed of transfer to neonatal um, intensive care units, is statistically significant such that you have a decrease of 6.6 .6 percentage points of the probability of a poor neonatal issue. So before, uh, so those are the, the main results. I will now move on to trying to explain a little bit more uh, how financial incentives are able to um, impact inequalities. So here we take a more, a little bit more of a normative approach uh, related to the theory of justice and philosophy of responsibility. So here the idea is that someone who smokes um, may be responsible for situ the situation or not. So inequalities in smoking can be due to effort that people exert to stop smoking or not, but also due to circumstances as uh, genetics or social backgrounds, and people should be compensated for inequalities that are due to circumstances. This is what uh, those two authors, Flaubert and Homer, are saying about, you know, whether, um, whether we should compensate inequalities or not. So if we try to apply this conceptual framework to our setting, we decided to think about the newborn in that way. They are not responsible for anything. So there should not be any difference in the outcome between newborns who are benefited from different circumstances. So if we think about two types of circumstances, for example, women who have mothers who have a different social status, they should have babies that have equal opportunity at birth. So the objective here will be to kind of equalize birth outcomes across the different level of circumstances. So we're looking at two different types of circumstances. The first one are social circumstances that we proxy by income. So we have three categories of income. So we have women who earn less than 18,000 euros per year. So this is the poverty line in France. Those who are between 18 and 30,000 annual income. 30,000 here is the median income in France and those who are above the median income. 
As for health circumstances here, we focus on those who, uh, on different levels of addiction to nicotine. So we use um, the Fagerstrom score that captures uh, addiction to nicotine with questions such that, um, how, how much time do you have between the time that you wake up and the first cigarette? So this is a uh, indicating of uh, the level of addiction. So this is what we observe. So here in each of those graphs, you have on the y-axis, the probability of having a low birth weight, which is a baby below 2.5 kilos. You have the three different categories. So below 18,000, medium and above the median income. In blue, the control group and in red, the financial incentive groups. So if we first only focus on the blue column, you see there is a social gradient here where those who are at the bottom of the income distribution have a higher probability of having a lower birth weight uh, newborn. What we observe now in the financial incentive group is that it decreased statistically significantly in the uh, low income group, as well as in uh, the, the medium group, let's say medium income group, and nothing really changed here in the um, higher uh, income group. So we kind of have now, if we look at only the red one, a kind of an inverse social uh, gradient here. So if our objective was to equal as opportunities of income, this didn't really work. However, we were still able to uh, reduce low birth weight among the low income uh, group. If we turn now to health inequalities measured as weak addiction here or medium to strong addiction here, we can look at what's happening in the control group where we see there is, there is very small difference between the two blue bars. And although it decreases in both group, we see still no difference between the red bars. So again, if our objective is to have equal opportunities at birth here, um, this is what we find using financial incentives because it was first efficient in improving birth weight in all group and they are almost equivalent in, uh, in both uh, group of circumstances with respect to health. So now we're trying to figure out what are the mechanism behind this. Does it mean that uh, women were more uh, likely to stop smoking in the low income group and more likely to stop smoking among the, the weekly addicted? So this is what we investigate here. So we're looking at whether uh, women were more likely to uh, continuously stop smoking during their uh, pregnancy. So here now the y-axis is continuous abstinence. So what we observe is not what we expected basically because what we observe here is that our financial incentive intervention was it had a larger effect on women who are above the median income and we see a difference here but it's not statistically significant. So it doesn't seem that it's continuous abstinence that is leading to this effect on birth weight among the low income groups. Well, here we clearly see that those who are um, weakly addicted are also those who are more likely to quit smoking, which kind of makes sense because if the uh, cost of effort is lower then financial incentives are more, uh, likely to compensate for this lower cost of effort. So we trying to see another mechanism that is not continuous abstinence, but smoking reduction. So we use two sets of indicator uh, to measure smoking reduction. So one is the total uh, number of cigarettes smoked by income groups. So this is what you will see on the left-hand side graph. And on the right-hand side one, you have the number of abstinent visits. So here is the number of times that we found abstinent. So here, what we observe is actually that smoking reduction. So both when, with both indicators is actually more important in the lowest income group. 
So we are able to explain the results that the, uh, the decrease, we are able to explain this result here that we observe with smoking reduction, while this result here seems to be more related to continuous abstinence. Let me now summarize very quickly the results. So we found that financial incentives is able to uh, reduce smoking during pregnancy because it was able to double continuous abstinence and improve the uh, newborn's outcome. Just a few words uh, in order to help us try uh, to help us put those results in perspective. So as I said at the beginning, birth weight is a great predictor of economic outcomes. So financial incentives may have also long lasting effects on the, the child and the future adults. We are in the process of doing the cost effectiveness analysis because the goal here is really to try to uh, convince policy uh, makers to implement financial incentives for pregnant smokers into usual care. This is something that is now recommended by the NHS in the UK. So we are confident that we will be able to convince policymakers in France to implement such a system in the usual care. Of course, this also depends on how particular our sample is because uh, it's a trial. So it also depends on who accepts to participate. So we just this week had access to a, uh, a survey that allows us to assess the external validity of a sample. And what we observe for now is that uh, we have a sample where women tend to be um, uh, of lower social status than in the general population of uh, pregnant women. And I want to finish by, by just saying a few words on, on social uh, inequalities. So although we're not able to equalize opportunities at birth according to social circumstances, what we observe is that we are able to improve uh, the uh, opportunities at birth of um, babies from mothers from the lower social uh, group. And this may be uh, uh, an outcome that is interesting in terms of uh, public health, because this is a group of people that we have really an impact on. And I think this is showing that this could be achieved with financial incentives. If we were to push forward this type of interventions and and, and, and using them for other type of population or to implement them in, in, in the usual care. It, it may be also important to assess acceptability in the general population of financial incentives. And this is something that we did. Actually, before we conducted the trial, we uh, conducted a survey to measure acceptability in the usual population. And we found that 53% of uh, this representative sample of the population were in favor uh, of financial incentives for pregnant smokers. But what the literature also says is that if you show people that this type of program is efficient and is improving the situation, uh, acceptability may be even larger. So we believe that this 53% is actually a lower bound of what the acceptability will be in France for such uh, type of programs. Thank you very much for your attention. And, and I don't know if there are a few minutes for questions that I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Leontin. That was fantastic. Uh, I think uh, let's get to the Q&A questions first. Um, there is one from Francis Thompson. Is it at all possible that part of the benefit for very low income mothers is simply that payment permit better nutrition during pregnancy. Maybe not a big effect, but can you comment on that? Yes, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Let me think, yeah. So we don't know about nutrition. However, we, uh, they were, we collected the weight at every single visit and we see no difference between the treatment and the control group at each visit. 
So it may have improved the quality uh, of nutrition, but we have no data on this. Thank you. Um, and there is another question from Roger Jenny. Can you explain, is it right step to reduce burden of smoking with financial incentive? Don't you think that it impact on addiction of monetary gain to pregnant women? Um, I'm not so sure I fully understand uh, the question. Is it a right? Right step. I, I'm also trying to understand this question. Um, so yeah. I, I mean, maybe maybe I can understand the second part of the or the question. What I didn't present to you today is that we also see an impact on craving, right? So there is something happening in the decision making process of those uh, pregnant smokers, where the level of let's say symptoms uh, related to the level of addiction is, is, is decreasing. So it's not only that they are stopping smoking, but they are also improving their health in terms of how much they are suffering from uh, smoking cessation. Thank you. I think those are the questions in the Q and A. Uh, to Justin, do you have any additional questions and comments? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it, it's a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to come back to the findings of, by income group because I think those are really interesting. And there was a, there's a couple things that interest me. So the first is that for like a, a given amount of money, I would expect a larger behavioral res response in terms of abstinence for the low income uh, women because you know it's a it, it, it would be presumably more motivating. Um, and you, you, you sort of find the opposite. And so that, that, that part of it is, I, I'm sort of curious how you view that. The other is I'm a bit skeptical about the argument that it's about a reduction in number of cigarettes. It didn't appear to be like sort of a, a huge uh, drop in terms of number of cigarettes. And I'm just wondering about sort of the biological plausibility, which is beyond what I understand, but like whether that could be responsible or if it might be that like maybe the effect happens to be stronger among the very lowest income, and the, the, like those are the ones who quit um, and maybe they're the ones who, who get sort of the health benefit or, and I wonder sort of if that, that could be part of what's going on instead of sort of this reduction argument. Yes, that, that's a great comment. Thank you. Um, so we are still in the process of trying to figure out what, what's going on here. So we are not able to explain the drop in low birth weight in the lower income group by continuous absence, but we still see an effect among those who were not uh, continuously abstinent. We, we still see a, a small effect, but I agree it's rather small. So our uh, what we are trying to investigate now is whether they were some action, some uh, women who actually benefit from uh, the visits themselves. So maybe low-income women had more to gain in tobacco counseling and relapse prevention and all those visits they had with the midwives, maybe they benefited more. So the fact that they came to maybe a little bit more visits in this group, uh, they may have benefited more when they, when they uh, got in those visits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm also curious about whether you looked at uh, heterogeneity across sites in terms of either like whether you heard anecdotally about how the intervention might have been carried out or um, in terms of effects because I, I could imagine like different providers sort of approaching the incentives very differently and that I, I know in my work I've actually found that that was important and I'm curious if you looked at that. Uh, so we are we didn't conduct any uh, subgroup analysis by sites because we have 18 of them so this will be too small and, and they did not manage to all recruit that much. So we have sites where we have 60 or uh, pregnant women and somewhere we have five. So we can't conduct that kind of analysis because it was not a stratified uh, randomization as well. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, but from anecdotal evidence, it's very hard to uh, get anything from that because uh, we were we we managed. I mean, we thought we were very clear on how the process worked, and there were a lot of monitoring. So we think there is a kind of homogeneity across the uh, intervention, especially because 
it's only the financial incentives that was different, right? The rest of the intervention was exactly as they would do usually. So in that respect, we are pretty confident that they are uh, quite a homogeneous treatment, uh, I mean, kind of not treatment, but uh, um, intervention in terms of uh, tobacco and uh, tobacco, uh, helping them to stop smoking. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so it, continuous abstinence was still, you know, fairly low overall, and there, there's still like an overwhelming majority of women who did not abstain, which I think is typical of a smoking cessation trial. But I'm curious about sort of like what additional resources you would think that uh, should be like, like other intervention components that should be tried, or um, you know, how to sort of uh, you know boost that number. I think it's um, if we were able maybe to pay them more for them to come at the visit to try to emphasize the importance for them to come at the visit, this would improve also because this would improve the sessions uh, rates. This is what, what came out after we discussed the results with the investigators. Uh, this is mainly what they, what they thought. There's a lot of dropouts of the study so, including for the follow-up of the prenatal period, uh, this is posing a number of, of uh, problems. Thank you. Um, there is a question from audience. Would you consider doing some qualitative follow-up among some participants to ask them directly how the incentives affected their motivation? Yeah, so we uh, we did not do this. Instead, what we did, we had a, a six months follow up uh, phone call that was supposed to be uh, done for every participant, but a lot of them actually uh, didn't pick up the phone. So at that phone call, we asked them actually what they thought uh, was the was the main driver basically of their smoking cessation or failure uh, to to stop smoking and. One question was whether they thought that, you know, we could give them more money, this would have helped, but none of those who were, who we were able to reach actually uh, said that money, uh, more money would have changed. Some of them say that um, more frequent visits, so they were monthly visits, but they said that if visits were every 15 days, for example, this would have helped them uh, trying to uh, engage more in smoking cessation. And the large majority said that there were personal issues and too, they were too addicted to uh, smoking to try to stop smoking. Thank you very much. Uh, we are about time. So let's turn to our, um, to Mike Pascal to wrap this up. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 135 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend.